Good morning. morning. All right, we're starting right off the bat with a confession. So uh, since the rest of the morning I get to confess way too much information about myself to you, you're going to start by confessing to me. How many of you are terrified of the stage or have some level of stage fright? All right, that makes me feel a lot better. (laughs) So many of you have come by, seen the mic on me this morning, be like, hey, have fun up there. Good job. We're so excited. I thought, well, that's comfortable from your seat. You know, that, that's lovely. You get to sit over there. But I was in uh, worshiping in the back, and God reminded me through that last song forever. All throughout Scripture, he talks about the fact that he is trying to reveal himself to us, that he desperately wants those of us who know him to talk about him so that other people can come into a relationship with him as well. But there's one Scripture in the Bible that says, listen, if we fail to proclaim what we know about him. He will make the rocks and the trees speak on his behalf. That's how much he wants to reveal himself to people. I took great comfort in that. The way I chose to interpret that this morning is that if I was dumb as a stump, he's still coming right through. So uh, uh, good luck to you, God. That's what I say this morning. (laughs) Um, Okay, so my name is Angela. And uh, if you only interact with me on Sundays, you don't perhaps know that I love history and I am really into antiques and particularly I like uh, taking something that had a use over here and using it in a new way. In fact, thanks to Shelby, who I, thank you Shelby, this is a necklace that Shelby gave me which is made out of a spoon handle and I love it because that spoon had a whole life and then it came to reside on my necklace and it gets a whole second life. So the way I look at this whole story series is that I get to share with you my story and the things that God has done to insert himself into my life and to rescue me from me. You'll see that theme. Uh, To rescue me from me. But beautifully, we're actually recycling because you get to take something that cost me years of unhappiness or (laughs) has caused great pain in my life and you get to recycle it in your own life and uh, get more mileage out of that. So that is the theory this morning as I share some of my more embarrassing moments. That's, I guess, what preaching looks like is you get to come up here and tell your most embarrassing moments. So there we go. Uh, Let's start right at the beginning. Um, This is me. I am the youngest of three children. And I have um, an older brother and an older sister, and they're a little bit closer in age than I was. I came a little bit later. Just enough for those two to be very similar in personality. They both married their first serious boyfriend or girlfriend. They knew what they were going to do in their career. I came along, I'm a little bit more of a free spirit. Just slightly a little bit more of a free spirit, um, which brings a lot of laughter and entertainment into our lives, and as you will see, a little bit of pain, as I had big dreams and not so many plans. Um, This next picture is a picture of my family. This is my faith story. So I was raised by those marvelous people that were on stage last week. Pastor Ron is my father, and that's my mom, Monica. God bless the 80s. (laughs) Look at that. That's something. Pretty sure Tom Selleck is my dad. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it. Okay, anyway. Um, I was raised in a strong Christian family, and I had a really great foundation of faith, both in knowing my Bible stories and watching my parents live risky lives. You heard them last week. That is totally how they lived all the way through my growing up. And they were extremely intentional parents, which was marvelous. So when it came time to put me in school, we went to a private Christian school, which was, I love, this next picture is like quintessential, my sister and I right there. So I'm the one on the right, the one that has no awards or certificates, a really big smile. My socks have fallen down to my ankles, and I'm having a party on stairs. I'm not sure uh, what was going on there. Lisa looks completely under control. Um, But we went to a private Christian school, which was super fun, because again, cementing that same stuff that I was learning at home. And then when it came time to go to college, my lovely sister with her awards went and did college tours and figured out where she was going to go. She picked this great Christian school. I went to visit her, and that was the end of my college um, research. Ah, well, come here. This is marvelous. So I went to Pacific Christian College in the 90s, and yes, that is me wearing a vest that I made myself. Really, really, and that's wave hair. So I am smack dab in the center. I went to Pacific Christian College, which is an incredible school I would highly recommend, now called Hope International University. The deal was, though, um, well, I'll just start with my first place where God just fully intersected my life. Here goes my life, here comes God, and changed the trajectory. 
My story, one of the first things that I'd like to say is there's no guarantee that your childhood defines you. I had all kinds of things lined up very serendipitously for me, and I had lots of things pushing me in the right direction. Sadly, though, I was completely sleepwalking or asleep at the wheel. I'm not sure exactly how to describe that, but I had enough head knowledge. I had great faith structure. I had all kinds of things going for me, and off I go to a bright and sunny future, and um, I was totally asleep at the wheel in my life. And uh, thankfully, I made my way through college um, fairly unscathed. I actually had the time of my life, but in, in retrospect, I was not really taking full advantage of that experience at all. Um, anyway, for me, I've heard statements like this before, and I've always thought that was for people who had a really rough upbringing. That was the way I interpreted, uh, interpreted that phrase, was that if you had a tough thing happen to you as a child, it doesn't have to define you as an adult, that you can go out and make the future that you want. And I love that. I actually think that is a total biblical theme, that God defines us uniquely based on how he knit us together and that he brings experiences and things into our lives in order to further what he wants to show himself to other people through us. What I had not stopped to think about was the fact that my wonderful childhood, my wonderful upbringing also doesn't define me. Some of us were raised in the church or some of us um, have a long history of faith. But I, I wasn't capitalizing on that. I wasn't leveraging that in any way, shape, or form. I wasn't being intentional with that. The assumption for me was, all right, well, I had all this great stuff, so that means I'll turn out a great person. Or I was given all these character lessons as a child, so of course I'll be a person of character as I get older. And the trouble was, as I got older, I was less and less satisfied with who I was becoming, and I couldn't put my finger on it because, again, I had a great childhood, and I did not rebel in the sense of, Here's what my parents taught me, and I went flying out this way. The problem is when you go asleep at the wheel, you just start meandering off. And so the first place where God just really intersected with my life was to shake me up and to say, um, hey, your, ch your childhood is not a guarantee of who you want to become. So um, I I'd like to share this scripture, which has become really special to me, and I'll first read what the Bible says, and then I will tell you how I see it in my head. It comes from 2 Chronicles. It says, Because the Lord's eyes scan the whole world to strengthen those hearts who are committed to him with all their hearts. I love that visual. For some reason, I just see God looking down on the masses, and there's this, all these heads, and we're looking down, and man, we are trucking on our lives, and we are trying really hard at what we're doing, and we're weighed down by the weights of the world, and, and off we go, and God is just scanning. And it's like when he sees somebody, even if their head is down, when he sees somebody whose heart is fully committed to him, they're just glowing. You know, they're just glowing amongst the crowd. And he's like, oh, there's one. All right, I'm giving it everything I got right over there. My prayer is that I would be that person. That when he looks around and he sees people with different credentials, some people's credentials are way better than mine. And some people were given no natural credentials at all from their childhood. But that our childhood doesn't define us. That when God is looking around to say, who's going to do great work on my behalf? Who's going to show the world how generous I am? Who's going to, who's going to? That it's not looking around at your credentials. He's not impressed by your credentials, nor is he overwhelmed by how little credential you have. That he looks around and he's like, there's one. That one's heart is fully committed to me, and I'm going to show strong support to them. That scripture to me totally speaks to no matter what your background was, that we're not defined by our childhood, and we can be anything that we want to be. So now it's your turn. So I want to recycle. That's what we're going to do this morning. So you'll see on your notes under this point, um, recycle this. Some of us, we need to wake up. Some of us are asleep at the wheel in our faith, and we can't remember the last time, or maybe we can remember the last time that we felt God strongly or that we took a risk on behalf of God, and maybe it was years ago. You're on an adventure today. Today is the day that God can do this, that you're going this way and God can step in and nudge you out of that rut. Some of us need to wake up. Maybe that's the thing you need to recycle out of my story, is I need to wake up. or I need to actually even ask God, hey, do you want to take a risk with me? I don't know if you have, but why not? Start there. Some of you need to redefine yourselves. Some of you were told you were a certain this or a certain that or you'll never be a this. Maybe a thing you need to be recycling is starting a redefinition of who you are. But I, if God is saying something to you through that first point about your childhood not defining you, that's why I want you to write down what you're recycling. I didn't give you 
application points for you to pick from. It's between you and God to pick what you'd like to recycle out of my story. That's the first idea, I would say. The second uh, place that God intersected with me, I'll get to in a second, but um, it comes straight out of the whole sleepwalking. So I'm sleepwalking out of college, and um, nope, let's go back. I, um, in the summer between my eighth grade and ninth grade year, we moved to Hawaii, and we had come from Oregon, where I had spent time on the Oregon coast, but at the Oregon coast, if you put your foot into the water for about 10 seconds, your whole leg turns purple. So you do not play in the waves of the Oregon coast. So we moved to Hawaii, and I just cannot wait to frolic in the ocean. And we get there, and our first trip to the beach, um, was not pretty. So how many of you have been on like some romantic vacation? You get to the beach, you're ready to go into the warm water, you walk in, you might even be holding hands because you were on a romantic vacation. You walk into the water, you begin to frolic in the waves, and that first wave pounds you, you're tossed and tumbled, you come up with a mouth full of sand, a nose full of salt water, and your biscuits are hanging out the back of your suit. Come on! <laughs> Come on, you know that's the case. So uh, that was sort of what happens as I was sleepwalking. By the way, the trick to that is you pull back, you observe the waves, then you find a place to stand that is not right where the waves break. I don't, I don't, that was ugly the, how long that took me to learn that. And in fact, uh, I was not alone. My family was right there with me being pummeled It took one of the natives to come up, hey, if you just move about 10 feet further, <laughs> You gotta love how those waves just roll right underneath you, or you dive into them, or whatever. But anyway, there's a wave strategy. There is a strategy on how to go about encountering what we encounter in life. And the second thing that God taught me was how to wake up out of this sleepy slumber. Um, part of the problem was not only was I given a great childhood, and I was totally taking advantage of that without actually taking advantage of that, um, but all of society tends to hint at the fact that if we will just survive, that will be enough. Let me show you what I mean. Let's see if you've heard um, this phrase, no pain, no gain, right? So, okay, pain means if I've survived pain, I will gain. Additionally, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I mean, come on, that, that's like a well-known, if I had just said what doesn't kill you, you would all know, it makes you stronger. The problem is that's not true. Sometimes what doesn't kill you just makes you bitter. Sometimes what doesn't kill you just leaves you wounded and limping through life. Sometimes what doesn't kill you just makes you suspicious for the future. Oh, that, this is rubbish. This is total rubbish, but it's so clever. We just go for it. Secondly, I, so I was searching around for something to show you with this, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger, and I found you this other one that is just delightful. Pain makes you, uh, Danielle, pain makes you stronger. Fear makes you braver. Heartbreak makes you wiser. Oh my stars, I have about five major heartbreaks that would not suggest I was getting any wiser because they pretty much looked exactly the same, one after the other. Where do we get this stuff? It, the, it, well, the internet obviously is full of it, but the truth is my heart was totally full of it, absolutely full of this kind of rubbish that it's like, well, if I'll just survive, I'll get stronger, I'm going to get stronger. So here is a second place where God just T-boned my life and said, hey, wake up, sister. There is no guarantee that pain produces growth. Now, that sounds like bad news, I realize, but it, really, it'll get better. There is no guarantee that pain produces growth. The truth is, lots of us live life with that stupid wave strategy where we'll just stand there and it's like, okay, I'm just going to brace myself harder. If you've actually done that wave thing, you know to turn this way, right? You turn sideways so that it's a little, not quite so strong. That we'll just think if we can brace ourselves and make it through the pain, we're going to be braver, stronger, and wiser. And, and um, God, like a lightning bolt out of the sky, said this thing to me. So here, let me tell you a little bit of my embarrassing stories. Um, I threw out, so my brother and my sister both married their first serious boyfriend or girlfriend. I was in kindergarten fully in love with a senior in high school, Bill Hurd. And uh, he left his Bible behind at church one time. I swiped it. I still have Bill Hurd's Bible. This is Bill Hurd right in the center of it. Uh, anyway, I was an idiot when it comes to boys. I mean, an idiot. So I'm tooling along, dating boy after boy, bringing them home. The family is gracious to him, but every time he would leave, inevitably in the kitchen while we were doing dishes to clean up, we would have the conversation about, so, Angela, what do you like about him? I know what that means. What that means is we're not seeing it, sis. We're not seeing it. That's, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. 
And I just would tell myself that they did not understand. Now, I have always been a sucker for the underdog. That was true. I just shouldn't have applied that in dating. Anyway, so I thought, oh, they just didn't understand. They can't see him like I see him. And so boyfriend after boyfriend after boyfriend would come through and break my heart. And uh, on we would go. And um, I thought my senior year of high school, I had found the guy I was going to spend the rest of my life with, and I was fairly miserable in that relationship, but it all made sense on paper. He was a Christian. That, all, that was all great. Until my mom and my sister pulled me aside on a Christmas break and sat down and said, sis, we got to talk. We got to talk about this. Uh, you were losing your personality. You were being disrespected. This is not, I, what do you like about this? You need to get out of this relationship. And I had an epiphany moment. Uh, oh my goodness, they're right. I was only staying it because I didn't have the courage to get out. And they gave me, I borrowed their courage that night. They gave me their courage. I broke up with him. And in grand style of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I literally thought, phew, they saved me. What if I had married him and spent the rest of my life feeling like this? And I thought, phew, and I picked back up and I got myself set for the next wave of pain. I never looked back. I thought, oh good, I've been saved. Fast forward a little while uh, down the road, quite a ways, like 10 years down the road, and I, really, I uh, find myself in a marriage that looks exactly like that relationship, only worse. And um, he, he was a different personality, and I thought I had found the secret, um, and I find myself in a relationship where I am losing my entire personality, and I am uh, crying all the time. I mean, whatever, it's not that hard to picture what it looks like. So... Um, I decide we got to do something about this marriage. And again, the family is speaking in, hey, how can we support? How can we help? And I get myself to counseling. My husband won't go with me. So I get myself to counseling and I sit down and in the very first counseling session, I tell him, of course, because this was truly why I was in counseling, I'm here to save my marriage. To which he asks, well, where is your spouse? To which I say, well, he wouldn't come with me, but I'm here to save my marriage. And in my very first counseling session, the counselor says to me, honey, I can't save your marriage by you. That's not going to work. It's going to take two of you to save your marriage. But while you're here, let's work on you. So off we go. We go to work on me. And I stay in counseling for the next year and a half and um, take great comfort. This was the season that God was waking me up out of that sleep and proving to me that pain does not produce growth. But it is my choice to determine what I want to do with my pain. At this point, I have signed on to a situation I can literally not live with. I, am, I literally cannot live with that. Um, it's when I realized that you can do nothing wrong and still not be doing anything right. I wasn't doing anything wrong and that I was trying to, to be the best person that I could and I was trying to save my marriage and I was trying to follow God with my whole heart and yet I wasn't doing anything right. Every, every wave that came at me was taking me down. And I love this verse from Philippians. It's Philippians 1.6. I'm sure about this. The one who started a good work in you will stay with you to complete the job by the day of Christ Jesus. I don't know where you are. Currently in my story, what I'm telling you right now, we are in the depths of despair. Um, I don't know, maybe you're right now in the depths of your despair. Maybe that's what that looks like. I take great comfort in this verse. God is still working. That story is not done yet. In the end, I could not save my marriage. I did not have a partner that would work with me, and I couldn't save my marriage and that looked like the death of a dream. And the truth is, before we move on to my third point, which where God intersects because he steps in at that moment in my life and makes all of the difference in the world. But before we go on to that, I'd like to stop and recycle again. Let's stop there. When it comes to this concept of um, pain does not necessarily guarantee growth, what is it that God might want you to recycle out of my pain? That was a terrible lesson to learn that took me a decade or more to uh, figure out. The truth is that growth is a choice that we make usually long before the pain hits. If nothing else, even if you uh, aren't sure right now what you can be doing to make growth out of the pain that you're experiencing, what I would say is let's make a commitment that when pain hits, we will look for the growth. Why in the world not? If the whole point of me sharing my story is so that you could get more mileage out of my pain, why in the world wouldn't you get mileage out of your own pain? That's one of the things I love about how God works. Romans 8.28, and there isn't a slide for this, but Romans 8.28 says, in all things, I'll work for the good of those who love me. I'll take any pain you've got and I can make something good out of it. Why wouldn't we make the commitment today to choose growth? 
Rather than have the wave strategy where we just stand and we brace ourselves and they just keep coming and coming, why wouldn't we say, when pain hits, I'm going to pull back and I'm going to get myself a pain strategy? That's what I needed to do with the waves. I needed to pull back and see where is the break line, and I'm going to get myself past that so that I can learn from the pain I've just experienced. The same thing is true in life. We can make the determination long before pain comes to pull back and say, when pain hits, I'm going to pull my head up, and I'm going to look around, and I'm going to look for God to take something out of this pain and make me better, rather than I'll just survive it, and I'll move on, and there'll be better days. There'll be better seasons. So I would say, let's recycle something out of that story. And it might just be that you make the commitment that when pain hits, you're going to look for growth, or we're going to use it for growth rather than just survive it. So I ended that last one on I can't save my marriage, and sure enough, I got divorced, and I stayed in counseling because it was clear that I had a pattern, something is going on here, that I keep picking the same guy. And so I ended up going into counseling one day and saying to him, okay, I really appreciate all the work that we've done. My marriage is obviously over. Here's our next project we're going to work on. How do I not do that again? I literally said that sentence. That was my opening sentence. How do I not do that again? I am terrified. I know myself well enough to know I am an idiot with boys. I will definitely be getting married again. How do I make sure I don't do that again? Enter Jason Robert Lamb. So uh, this is my husband, Jason. And believe it or not, he was already in my life. When I lived in Hawaii, he was my best friend. But he was in that brother category. And boys... You've had the friends talk. I know you have. Some girls have had the friends talk too. Jason, bless his heart, had had the friends talk so many times in our friendship, he promised he would never bring up his feelings for me ever again. So fast forward literally 17 years. 17 years, bless his heart. 17 years, and I've gone through counseling, and literally the process of working through my pain and actually growing from it changed my taste buds, and I am dead in love with Jason. I am certain I'm going to marry him, but we are friends, and it takes me a year to get the courage up to say something to him. And uh, when I finally did, he was hilarious. He was like, I've been feeling it too, but I promised myself I was never willingly walking into the friends talk again. (laughs) Never. So it took us 17 years. So uh, this next picture is just me loving my Sam. So our last name is L-A-M. And Jason in high school had atrocious handwriting. Back in the day, he had atrocious handwriting. But his, uh, his L looked like an S. And so he has been forever branded by me as Sam, which is a little confusing if you don't know us well for me to be calling my husband by someone else's name. But that is how he is, and he is such a blessing to me, which brings me to the third place that God has intersected with my life. There is no guarantee that the death of a dream is a bad thing. When I was getting a divorce, that, looked, that was clearly a death of a dream, but it looked like an atrocious thing. I was doing that while on staff at the church. I just couldn't figure out what you guys would think of me. I already felt like a failure. I mean, all of the death of a dream just felt so heavy, but what God has proven to me is that the death of dream is not necessarily a bad thing. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I say this because I know what I'm planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I'll give you hope and a good future. Oh, some of us, you might want to skip right ahead and write Jeremiah 29 11 in your recycle this. Some of us need to tattoo that scripture on our hearts for God to say, listen, I got this. I got this. I'm talking to you. I'm walking you through your life because I know what I have for you. It's a good future. And some of us just struggle to see God that way because he seems something else to us. Or maybe we don't even know him well enough to be able to uh, trust him enough that he is what he is saying what he means. Um, I'd like to show you a picture from a little bit before Halloween. Uh, Jason and I took eight kids to the pumpkin patch. This is the picture of my future. This is what I always pictured life would be like. Jason would have one or two kids attached to him in some way, shape, or form. We would be laughing our heads off, and that was how we were going to roll towards the sunset. But those are three different families' children that we borrowed (laughs) in order (laughs) to go to the pumpkin patch, and it was one of the highlights of my year. I absolutely loved it. Um, However, 
Jeremiah 29, 11, about God having a good future for us has never meant more to me than in this last three years. Jason and I have been married for five years now, and uh, we are three years into what the doctors call unexplained infertility. We've done every test under the sun, and they have looked at it, and they have said, we have no idea what's wrong with you, but clearly you're not pregnant, so we will just slap this um, title on you. And if you had taken me back six years ago and said, after you get married, you're going to discover you're not going to have children, or the doctors won't know how to help you have children, I would have been quaking in my boots, and I would have totally second-guessed, what do you mean good future? What do you mean by that? How can you possibly say a good future when my entire life, I, don't, I didn't mention this, but my college career was in um, early childhood education, and I told people in college, I have no intention of ever being in the classroom. I just know my whole life is going to be around children, and I want to do it well. I had intentions before falling in love with new life and staying here of moving to Africa to work in an orphanage for children who were orphaned by AIDS. And I just, my whole life was going to be about kids, around kids, my own, yours, it didn't matter. I just wanted to be around kids. So for this to be a chapter in my story, uh, I, I couldn't, I would not have been able to fathom it. But having God walk me through the process of falling in love with his plan for my life, and that comes from knowing him directly, for, for that to be the case, for me to get to the moment where I discover, so the way I found out that we were infertile, I had been doing tests and all that stuff, but they had said, before we can do any of the serious stuff, you need to go take this perfunctory class. So I was game for that. I was like checking the boxes to get to where we could get to to find out what was going on. I show up to the class and she says, are you here for the infertility class? And I was taken aback. That was the first time that word had ever been used for me was like, uh, well, I literally said, if we're just going to be honest, huh, well, that's kind of a serious word. <laughs> that, was my, that was my response. I didn't know that day was the day I was going to walk in and find out that they think we're never going to have children. I, didn't, I wasn't prepared for that day, but I was totally prepared for that day because God has become my friend. And just like we give our friends the benefit of the doubt, and just like when our friends look like they might be doing something that harms us, but then you look at it, it's like, well, they would never do that. So there must be some explanation that doesn't make sense to me. But I, before I can even ask my friend uh, what their motives were, I could give them the benefit of the doubt. The truth is God has become my friend. I want to share this poem. I put it in your notes so you could take it home, because for some of us, I think we need to start seeing God this way. This poem is just Ted Loader talking about how he prays. How shall I pray? Are tears prayers, Lord? Are screams prayers? Are groans or sighs or curses? Can trembling hands be lifted to you or clenched fists or the cold sweat that trickles down my back or the cramps that knot my stomach? Will you accept my prayers, Lord, my real prayers rooted in the muck and the mud and the rock of my life and not just the pretty cut flowers, gracefully arranged bouquet of words? Will you accept me, Lord, as I really am, messed up mixture of of glory and grime. Oh, I want to talk to God that way. I want you to talk to God that way. I want you to know him in such a way that you can bring anything you've got and you're not holding it back because it's got to be all the, the beautiful bouquet of words. Let's just talk to him. So God being my friend, uh, I have realized a couple of things. I want to show you another thing that I found on the internet. There is good stuff on the internet. It's not all just that rubbish. So this is a roller coaster, which I'm totally biased. I apologize if you don't like roller coasters. But for those of us that do, I love this phrase. Life is like a roller coaster. It has its ups and downs, but it's your choice to scream or to enjoy the ride. I love it. I am choosing to enjoy the ride because impossible odds set the stage for big miracles. I have no idea how God is going to get this thing to where I can look at the infertility and just tell you, nope, that was totally God's design and I adore it. I can still get teared up, no problem, thinking about what does that look like my future with no grandchildren or children to come visit me in the hospital or what does that look like? But here's what I do know. God loves impossible odds. He is not intimidated by the circumstances in your life, wondering how he's going to sort that out. He loves impossible odds. And too often, our prayers revolve around the idea of reducing the odds that are stacked against us. God, please protect me from this. Please keep that from happening. Please give me courage to face this because I'm quaking in my boots. Let's go out and storm the castle. Let's go out and be who God made us to be, every square inch of it. So here's my question about Recycle This. How big is your God? My God for the vast majority of my life was about 5'7", about yay wide. 
kind of bossy. <laughs> uh, how big is your God? If you don't know God well enough to call him your friend, dive into the Bible. If you know the Bible stories, start counting on God like you are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being swept out of the fiery furnace, or Daniel in the lion's den. These are stories maybe you grew up with. Start living like they matter, like God would want to do that for us. Let's go do it. I want to make two book recommendations because here's something else you should know about me. I am an avid reader, so I apologize if you're not a reader, but the truth is there is good stuff out there in books. So two books I want to recommend to you. The Good and Beautiful God. If you don't know God or if you're stuck in a rut with God and you can't seem to get yourself out of it, The Good and Beautiful God can paint a new picture for you. A God that is generous and loving. The God that Jesus knows firsthand and came to life on earth in order to show us. That book can alter the destiny of your life. And then secondly, in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. If you tend to pray prayers that revolve around reducing the odds stacked against you, you need to read this book. You can read it very quickly. It's not heady. In a pit with a lion on a snowy day is going about and storming the gates of hell. Uh, I will leave you with one last little slide. There's just this little conundrum, but it makes my heart smile. Life comes at us. You decide how you want to respond. Let's do it.